Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's now five minutes past the hour. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, high time for us to begin the event. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to this, this uh, introductory event uh, for the Canadian community to get to know our new ambassador to the Russian Federation uh, and uh, the Republic of Armenia, an ambassador designate to the uh, Republic of Uzbekistan. Uh, I think that that uh, designate, uh, the designation will be removed after the ambassador is able to travel there and, and, and officially present credentials. But in any case, we're uh, very pleased and excited by the strong showing that we have today. Uh, I, I should start by wishing everybody Happy Canada Day! It's the 153rd anniversary of uh, the Confederation of Canada, so uh, uh, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, the Russian government was kind enough to make it uh, a non-working day for us today. They had perhaps uh, other motivations, but uh, we won't uh, look into that right now. Uh, in any case, I hope you all enjoyed the day, uh, and I'm looking forward to a productive session as well. Just a few uh, technical details. For those of you who don't me know me, I am Nathan Hunt. I'm the chairman of the board of the Moscow chapter of Serba. Um, the, uh, I'm not uh, chairman of the entire association. That honor goes to, to Gilles Breton, uh, who is uh, joining us as an attendee. Uh, attendees will not have video or audio functions. You'll be able to see the panelists, which are the seven people that you see in front of you. Uh, and you'll be able to type questions and answers, uh, or questions anyway, into the Q&A function on your screen. So uh, below the, the uh, portraits that you see, uh, you can see a Q&A box. And if you click on it, uh, you can simply uh, type in your question there. And I, as moderator, will be vetting questions and will determine what uh, specific questions we will ask to the ambassador. Um, before I introduce the ambassador, I will say that this event is viewed as a, um, I don't want to say technical event, but it's not viewed as a political event. We're not here to debate Canadian government policy. Some of the questions that were submitted in, in advance, for instance, addressed uh, Canadian government policy relating to the sanctions, relating to Russia's position in Ukraine, and other uh, uh, issues like that. I should just say that the ambassador is the mouthpiece of the Canadian government. You know, her views will be no different than what you will read on the website of the uh, uh, Government Affairs uh, Canada, international.gc.ca. Um, and uh, she's not here to debate those views. We're not here to debate those views. We're here to, to talk about how the embassy is functioning and expects to be functioning in the upcoming months uh, in view of the uh, pandemic, which uh, has created unprecedented challenges for, uh, for many people around the world. So uh, please, uh, I would ask you to avoid political questions. Uh, since that's not the purpose of this uh, webinar. Uh, okay, without further ado, I will introduce the ambassador, and I will ask her to go ahead and introduce her very competent staff afterwards and call on them as appropriate. Alison Leclerc uh, got her uh, BA in political science from York University in 1987. She joined, joined the Department of External Affairs that same year. Uh, at headquarters, she served in divisions responsible for human resources, human rights, environment, and energy. She was Deputy Director of Policy Planning from 2002 to 2005, Director of China, Mongolia, and Taiwan Relations from 2005 to 2009, Corporate Secretary from 2014 to 2016, and until recently was Senior Arctic Official and Director General for Arctic, Eurasian, and European Affairs from 2016 to 2019. Overseas, she served in Brasilia from 1989 to 1991 as Second Secretary at the Canadian Embassy in Brazil uh, for Political and Public Affairs. In Stockholm, she served in 1998 to 2002 as political counselor at the Canadian Embassy in Sweden, and in Geneva from 2009 to 2014 as minister counselor and deputy permanent representative. Uh, Alison Leclerc was designated uh, ambassador to the Russian Federation, Republic of Armenia, and uh, Republic of Uzbekistan late last year, late 2019. Um, and uh, we are thrilled because honestly, we didn't know who would take the job. Uh, but uh, from all of the interactions that we've had with Allison, she has been a true friend of Canadian business uh, and of uh, Canadian business interests around the world, including in the countries that she now represents. So we're excited and thrilled to have you with us. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. Ambassador Leclerc, I will turn the, the floor over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nathan. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome. Uh, and thank you very much to you and to Serba. Thanks and congratulations for taking this initiative. 
uh, it's a huge pleasure for me to have this opportunity to um, uh, to meet virtually the Canadian community over your broad territory. So uh, thank you very much. And if I may echo you, Happy Canada Day, Bonne fête to Canada, Nyom Canadi. C'est vraiment pour moi un plaisir d'être ici avec vous. Uh, le, 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 comme Nathan a déjà dit, le bout de cette conversation, c'est, bon, premièrement, introduction, uh, et par la suite, de vous donner un survol des opérations de l'ambassade, uh, les services qui sont disponibles à vous, la communauté canadienne, uh, et autant que possible, une idée de ce que nous planifions planifieront uh, à l'avenir. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I hope that this conversation will give us a chance to get to know one another a little bit uh, and, uh, and uh, will help you uh, understand what's been happening at the embassy and uh, what we think might be happening at the embassy. Obviously, COVID has had a radical change on all of our lives. Um, I must say that speaking for me and I think also looking at what server has done what what we've seen is the silver lining of huge technological advances in our capacity to talk to one another uh, in this format so uh, I I'm, and this is proof of it so I'm really glad to be here uh, with you uh, not alone obviously would never have that um, and uh, so would like to introduce my team but in doing so it's it's funny when you notice things and it's in looking at this screen that I must admit I am on this day where we celebrate Canadian values. I'm really so delighted to have on my team a such a great representation of, of women. Um, I mean, I love Dan too, uh, but, uh, but it is great that we have an embassy team that is so representative of the Canadian population. So um, uh, I have two members of my trade team, our senior Trade Commissioner Anik Ule. Anik, maybe you could just, yes, that's unique. Anik uh, and Heather Bistrick uh, with the Canadian flag behind her. Uh, head of our immigration program or migration program, Danielle Unrau, coming to you from quarantine in Canada. Uh, and our uh, head of consular, Rebecca Braun. So, uh, uh, so I'll just dive right in and uh, hope to answer some of your questions and what I say in my introductory remarks. Um, and of course, uh, then take any questions. Uh, J'aimerais dire que nous sommes à votre disposition à répondre à vos questions, soit en français, soit en anglais, ni uh, uh, pour uh, le bout de mes remarques initiales, je vais parler uh, en anglais. Uh, so I think the most important thing that I would I, I, I want you to know is that the embassy has remained open throughout uh, the COVID crisis. Um, we, our services have changed somewhat. In times of crisis, we do have protocols whereby we focus on delivering essential services um, and, we, we, uh, and then other services as possible. So, um, that has meant that uh, we have been here to, of course, support Canadians, uh, support Canadians in distress, uh, support Canadians in their efforts to get back home, our consular services, um, and uh, that's Rebecca's program. Um, in this case, because migration services uh, were not really possible except on an exceptional basis, uh, consular also benefited enormously from Dan's help and expertise. Um, we certainly maintain dialogue uh, with the Russian government and of course uh, we kept the embassy open uh, uh, with all that that entails. Um, I will get in on a more program specific basis but since this is a, her a Serba hosted event I do just want to say up front that um, while the, the a number of uh, Canadians did uh, uh, staff uh, and our locally engaged staff, Canadians evacuated back to Canada, our locally engaged staff, of course, not able to work, uh, but the tra trade pro program really uh, proved to uh, be, first of all, uh, a program that continued to uh, uh, be in demand uh, with services 
being uh, requested and uh, we're able even in a change format uh, to be able to respond to those services so uh, a, a program that remained active throughout uh, throughout the process so that is an overview um, and now just let me go in a little more specifically so turning first to consular because in times of crisis that is the program that spikes fastest uh, and that needs the most attention uh, we are first and foremost here to help our fellow citizens uh, um, uh, in uh, in times of need so you know our relations an important aspect of our foreign policy part of our core mandate um, it is always needs to be there, agile and responsive in terms uh, uh, to respond to uh, to uh, uh, to world events. Uh, and this is an example of a crisis that is we've all heard this word before, but I'll use it again because it's the only one that fits unprecedented in nature. In that, often when there are crises that demand our consular capacity, they happen in one part of the world. Um, this, of course, was very different. It happened everywhere. It happened at the same time. It happened differently. Um, so we, for example, were not one of the consular centers that had to deal with uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of stranded Canadian tourists. Um, but there was, nevertheless, uh, a surge in demand for consular assistance um, in the context of this uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, so I would like to give you uh, some sense of what uh, what uh, the work that we undertook at that time. So you'll re recall uh, that Prime Minister Trudeau issued a global travel advisory to Canadians in March. Uh, and since then, the team at the MC in Moscow, as well as our honorary consuls in Vladivostok and Uzbekistan, have assisted over 300 Canadians and permanent residents with flight information uh, on how to return to Canada from Russia, Uzbekistan, and Armenia, and have helped many hundreds more with issuing emergency passports, questions about self, safe sheltering in place, exemption letters for permanent residents wanting to reunite with families in Canada, uh, and all other consular questions that reach us in non-crisis time. So life still happens even in times of crisis. Um, and, I, uh, and of course, there was this specific special loan program that was offered by the Canadian government to assist Canadians in returning home on, a, on an urgent basis. And uh, that actually represented a new business line for us. And I think in the end, we had something like, I'm not sure, 400 or something like that. It actually got quite high. I may be exaggerating that, but uh, in any event. So, um, and then a fun fact for you. Uh, these three countries, the ones to which I'm accredited, as is Rebecca, uh, Russia, Armenia, and Uzbekistan, are the largest geographic territory uh, that we cover from a diplomatic perspective in our whole network of 260 consular service points in over uh, in 150 con uh, countries. Uh, we maintain constant services in all our territories throughout the COVID crisis, and that was really due to a, a dedicated team, uh, Rebecca and her team, but that team expanded from other programs it needed to be to meet the demand uh, and uh, and we did our level best to make sure that Canadians were safe and were able to weather the crisis as, uh, as best they could. So that's what happened now and I know this becomes of keen interest what's going to happen. Um, uh, there were some uh, offices that well, passport offices uh, closed and have not reopened with the travel advisory. Uh, travel was not, uh, only essential travel was happening. So passport offices have not yet reopened. Um, but we here at the embassy are accepting regular passport application if urgent travel is necessary. Uh, we do have new procedures and protocols to make sure that both our clients and our workforce remain safe. Um, so there are, uh, uh, there's a process that involves uh, pre-screening of applications electronically, uh, verifications by video call as necessary, uh, and then uh, applications being couriered rather than um, being delivered in person to minimize uh, direct contact. So um, if you have a passport question, uh, it is as simple as emailing our consular team and uh, give us the details of your situation. We will do our best to get back to you as fast as possible. 
I do want to make a pitch for our uh, ROCA system. I hope that ROCA is an acronym that at least some of you are familiar with. It is short for Registration of Canadians Abroad. Um, it's a really important safety and security tool for Canadians when they're traveling or working abroad. Um, it, it, it gives tells us that you're in the country and for how long, and it also gives us your contact information. So if we need to reach you urgently, we can. We use ROCA consistently throughout the crisis uh, with messages to get to all Canadians who were registered on the ROCA system, um, giving them information about uh, local health measures, but also about available flights to return to Canada, and new regulations, quarantine in Canada, uh, information about uh, you know, how to reach our office, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think Serba has shared a message on how to register uh, with ROCA. It is, having used it myself uh, when I travel on holiday, it is, I think, pretty easy to use. Um, uh, but I think our view, it's not used enough. And we would really, really like to see everybody who is living and working uh, in this region to be registered on the system. Uh, I spoke a little bit earlier about uh, the silver lining of COVID. And uh, this is relevant to our consular services as well as our uh, migration. Uh, services and Dan can speak to that in a little more uh, detail. Um, uh, but we, you know, we have seen uh, efficiencies now. It's virtual technology because it has really forced us uh, to use it on a regular basis uh, to minimize risk. It means we'll be um, systematizing and rolling out some of these efficiencies on an ongoing basis, uh, and that should make it easier for people who live far from our points of service to nevertheless get the same uh, level and quality of service in terms of uh, virtual interviews, for example, uh, so that you don't have to uh, travel for an in-person interview or delivering passports. Um, so it is part of an ongoing objective of ours to in improve service to Canadians. Uh, and, um, um, and now, we know on and on, uh, for the foreseeable future is not just about better service, it's about safer service, safer service for you and safer service for us. So uh, that will remain you know, a, a guiding light for us as we, um, as we go. Um, uh, on, I think then I wanted to just go to, uh, yeah, migration since it's related to travel like consular. Uh, there are travel restrictions in place, of course. As I said, the immigration section, uh, the demand for immigration services fell. Um, the immigration section in Moscow and in its uh, associate service center, Warsaw, uh, remained open and uh, uh, helped the consular surge, but also helped clients where exemptions were possible to ensure that they were able to travel to Canada to be re reunited uh, with family members. Um, at this stage, travel restrictions remain in place until June 30th. We don't know, you know, we've seen these things be extended before, so that's all we know for now. Um, right now, the possibility to travel to Canada is subject to two factors. Uh, you have to be able to leave your country of residence. Uh, regular commercial flights, as I'm sure we all know, for those living in Russia anyway, uh, mid-July is the date that's being discussed, but we won't know that it's happening until it happens. Um, and then permission for foreign nationals to, to enter Canada. Um, there is a possibility that, the, uh, that our operations here will reopen on a larger scale in, um, in July. Uh, and uh, we would encourage you to, well, sign up for WOCA <laughs> um, and get those updates. Uh, but uh, watch our website, watch the travel.gc.ca site uh, for the, the latest information about, uh, about migrations. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll interrupt you for just a second, Ambassador. The, the uh, people are saying that uh, everything is expected to return to normal in July. And we all know July is coming. We're just not sure when. That's. <laughs> yeah. I think the date that I keep seeing it for uh, commercial flights is July 15th out of Russia. So, I mean, there are still flights that are happening, just not on that commercial schedule. So, you know, when, when our surge effort 
on uh, repatriation was at its height, uh, we were sending out, we did a survey with as many, um, uh, con with as much contact information as we had uh, to gauge needs for uh, Canadians and permanent residents wanting to leave, uh, or to, to uh, return to Canada. Uh, and we're also pushing out information about uh, Aeroflot, uh, well, about flights from our, um, our territory. So uh, those three countries, um, um, you know, Aeroflot was running flights, Lufthansa was running flights, not to Canada, but to European cities where um, it was possible to transit to a flight to Canada. Those flights are continuing. In fact, I think there's almost one a day now um, that can be booked, um, but they're not the regular commercial schedule. That we keep hearing is gonna be July 15th, but again, not to, uh, uh, it'll be, it has, it has, as far as I know, it hasn't been confirmed. So it, as far as uh, our the immigration services, passport offices, the visa application centers, um, I, I think everybody is now looking at July, but exactly as you say, not quite sure uh, when. So I don't know whether before I move on, um, whether Dan, you want to add anything, if you have any new information, would be great to hear it. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, I just wanted to say about the um, the visa application center has been closed, obviously, since March when this originally began, and it looks like they will be reopening in Russia in a phase over July. Um, we were originally hoping that the visa application center could reopen on July seventh, but now it's looking like that may be postponed for another week till maybe mid mid July. Um, all that to say is that we are hoping that services will resume in July. Now, one further added difficulty is that the travel restrictions have actually been moved to July 31st. Um, so they've been extended from June 30th to July 31st, just the point of clarification that uh, the travel restrictions are still in place at, at this point. And just before July 31st, we're not certain yet what's going to happen there, but hopefully we can see some, uh, see some relief on, on that front. Um, but I'll go into further detail when, when I respond to some of the questions about, about this. But maybe Rebecca, do you have any points about flights leaving? Uh, thanks. Um, so I, I do encourage uh, you to look at the ROCA message that was posted on the CERBA website. Uh, while regular flights haven't resumed, Aeroflot has several flights every week um, and we would recommend uh, the points via Frankfurt and London because you can transit within a day um, because most countries only allow transit at this point. I mean, the EU rules actually just came out yesterday. They won't allow travelers from Russia into Europe. So again, it's it's critical that you plan, uh, well plan your, your trip to Canada uh, and minimize any transit time. But I can't uh, comment on when more regular flights will resume. Okay, thank you. So I'll turn now to trade. Uh, as I said at the outset, the trade program has remained busy uh, throughout the, um, the COVID crisis. Um, and I, 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 I hope, I think, I'm pretty sure uh, that uh, clients uh, on, online here uh, will have seen, even though the team actually uh, was split between uh, Russia and Canada, that um, that that service remained uh, seamless uh, to our clients, um, and certainly I know they remain very busy. So, uh, and again, it was a another really good example of uh, you know necessity being the mother of invention, um, the uh, technological leap, the innovation to move to um, what was a minority of our business to then entirely uh, delivering it, uh, it virtually. Uh, I don't think that that is something that anybody would want to uh, see uh, for our future. Face-to-face -face contacts are hugely important in relationship building and in supporting Canadian companies. Um, uh, um, and so we do want to be moving back to that when it is safe to do to do so. Um, as it stands now, our last 
uh, in-person event was uh, PDAC in Toronto, where our uh, trade team was on the ground in course uh, and uh, worked very closely, of course, uh, with Serba in, uh, in the event that they do at that annual mining conference. So that was, uh, as ever, uh, a large and very uh, positive event that brought uh, key stakeholders um, from um, uh, uh, countries across our, uh, our uh, region. And um, hopefully we'll be back to normal for PDAC next year, but time will tell. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, uh, we, you know, we have switched to uh, virtual contact, virtual initiatives. Uh, Serb has been doing some great work, so kudos to you, Serb, for everything that you've been doing. Uh, for our part, our, uh, I think our, our biggest one was an EduCanada fair uh, that took place at the end of May. Um, at that, we had 50 Canadian educational institutions, hundreds of students uh, from across uh, Russia, Uzbekistan, and Armenia. And I think Russian students were actually, um, they weren't the biggest contingent, but they were the second biggest contingent of all of the uh, the countries that participated in that. I think Turkey was, uh, it was students from Turkey that were the biggest, yeah, and even nodding, but Russia was number two. So um, it really shows, I think, the, the power of those virtual platforms uh, to bring people together, and uh, we will certainly want to leverage that uh, in the future. Um, so for now, the team continues to provide significant market access support. Uh, to Canadian agricultural companies and to maintain uh, bilateral trade interests uh, uh, in three countries. Uh, the volume, you know, as I said, not quite business as usual, um, but it has been steady um, and we take that as good news, indicative of uh, growing interests and opportunities that we see in the region. Um, it, you know, I think Uzbekistan merits particular mention here uh, with the opening of its uh, economy under the current government. Uh, and the ongoing uh, reforms, including economic reforms uh, launched by uh, President uh, uh, Mirzi Yoya. And I should say in that context that uh, uh, on a more comprehensive level, we are uh, uh, um, making good gains in strengthening our uh, platform for, for bilateral dialogue uh, with Uzbekistan. They're very, very keen to partner with us. Um, we certainly see economic opportunity there. They see us as a support, or sorry, as a, as a source of, of uh, support in their reforms, uh, but also for expertise, for technology, uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, want to, want to have uh, a good circle of, of partners in a very uh, interesting competitive region, uh, shall we say. So um, I've just started a monthly uh, conversation with uh, the Uzbeki ambassador to Canada as a, uh, ha to have a predictable platform where, where we are talking about what is going on on our bilateral agenda and where there are opportunities uh, for us to work together to advance them. So, um, you know, at this stage, our trade, bilateral trade with Uzbekistan is relatively uh, modest, but it, the growth rate is pretty impressive. Um, it's, uh, it's doubled almost uh, just in the, in the last year uh, to 12 million from 7 million. Uh, agriculture and agri-food exports uh, grew by almost 2% in the first 11 months of 2019. They've almost reached 3.3 million, uh, which is about equal to agricultural experts at the last five years. So you can see the impact of the economic opening uh, and the opportunities there. And uh, the MC and its, its uh, trade program is here to support Canadian, uh, Canadian companies. Um, there is no doubt, it is important to say, that uh, CERBIT is playing an extremely important role in the progress that we are seeing. Uh, you know, uh, last year's um, trade mission from Alberta uh, to Uzbekistan, uh, uh, a trade mission that we uh, worked on together, uh, was the largest ever to Uzbekistan and uh, was extremely successful. So it's an example of uh, the great work that Serbia is doing and the value uh, that we attach to our, our partnership. Uh, so in concluding on trade, I'm going to, having, having sort of been going up uh, in my um, 
uh, and giving you good news. Uh, I do need to, to finish on a, a less positive note, uh, and that is uh, to, to say, to tell you, uh, some of you may know that Anik, our senior trade commissioner, uh, finishes her term uh, this year in Moscow. So uh, the time has come to uh, say farewell to Anik uh, and to thank her uh, enormously for all of her work. And I should say, you will, uh, those of you uh, uh, who are involved in trade will know uh, Anik, I'm sure, from the great work that she's done as trade. Uh, but uh, she was also charging for Uzbekistan and Armenia for a prolonged 18 month period in the gap between ambassadors, including a time uh, where Armenia hosted the La Francophonie Summit and our Prime Minister uh, was the only Francophonie uh, member to do a bilateral visit to Armenia. So she has had a, a, a huge workload and has stepped up enormously and done amazing work. Uh, we benefited enormously from her extensive uh, trade knowledge, uh, experience and professionalism um, and uh, we'll miss her dearly. But will absolutely wish her well uh, for the future. So, um, Anik, all the very best. Um, Can I say a few words, um, Alison? Absolutely, over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I want to uh, thank you, um, Ambassador, but also to thank you, Nathan, and the uh, two Alexes in your team, but also all the other chapters of CERBA um, across the region, across Canada as well. We've cooperated over the last four years on many missions, including the one that the ambassador was referring to, the, the biggest ever and probably most successful to Uzbekistan in May 2019. Um, I know that there are many business people in the virtual room. I can't see you, uh, but I do hope that my words of thanks are reaching you because you've been part of you know this very um, this very nice posting, very uh, stimulating. Uh, so I want to thank uh, each and every one of you uh, for your cooperation over the, the years, and of course the great team at the embassy. You know I work closely with them uh, to provide the business community uh, visas uh, when we can. Um, I've been working with Rebecca, who before uh, joining the concert team was uh, on the trade team uh, and was part of the success that we've enjoyed uh, over the last couple of years. And of course, uh, Heather, there's also Stephanie, I know in the virtual room, uh, but Heather and maybe uh, the ambassador was about to, um, to announce uh, the news, but um, Heather will be, actually has been as of Monday, uh, replacing me uh, and is now the acting uh, senior trade commissioner. So I welcome her. Most of you know her. She's very good. She knows all our markets very well. Uh, she's been supporting many of the companies present over the last couple of months or since January 2019 when she joined us and she will just continue to do the, the very good work that she's been uh, showing and demonstrating over the, the, the last year and a half. So Welcome to Heather and uh, goodbye and thank you to all of you. Yeah, thank you, Anik. Thank, thank you, Anik, for your excellent leadership. We've, we've uh, always had support from you, not only in the visa question, but also in uh, support for Canadian companies looking to come to the market for existing companies looking to uh, uh, take care of certain business issues. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you and your very competent staff. Thank you for the last four years uh, of sharing your talents with us, and we'll look forward to working with Heather going forward. Great. Thank you. And yes, indeed. Thank you, Anik, and uh, welcome to Heather. Still looking forward to uh, working with you. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, as, yeah, and wishing all the best to Anik. Okay, so I'll turn now to our uh, what is now formally called the foreign policy and diplomacy section, informally known as the political section, um, uh, who have a mandate that includes monitoring and reporting on domestic and foreign policy developments uh, in uh, the three countries. Um, that has continued, of course. Um, 
we have three countries that have interesting political developments to uh, monitor and report on. And so um, it's, uh, it's an enjoyable mandate. Of course, uh, the, uh, the lens is increasingly on COVID uh, and how COVID has uh, the, the, the uh, political, economic and social impact of COVID-19 uh, in our uh, three countries. Um, another important part of their, now, their mandate, of course, is to, uh, is to uh, build and sustain a network of partners and uh, in contacts to advance our priorities, to defend Canadian interests, um, and to identify and build cooperation based on our shared interests and shared priorities. Uh, so that, that, of course, uh, continues. I would say that our, our focus, uh, uh, and I'll say more, more of this in sort of my concluding remarks about you know, my own activities and, uh, and looking forward, but uh, it, it, just to say, of course, it is very much on finding where we can work together. Um, Nathan mentioned that I bring my, my job in the immediate past was combine the Arctic, but also this part of the world. Uh, the Arctic is an area that is one for you know, obvious for cooperation uh, with Russia, of course, um, uh, but there are others that have uh, intersections with uh, with uh, uh, the prosperity agenda too, with our trade program, also itself a priority. Um, but when we talk about academic exchanges, cultural exchanges, you can also see intersectionalities uh, there. Um, the political section also has uh, program funds that it disperses. Uh, and that too, uh, these, these are it's a, it's a small program uh, funding uh, that usually uh, supports efforts in Armenia and Uzbekistan on, uh, on social issues of shared priority, gender equality, um, um, climate, um, um, health. So health has gotten bigger. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, we really have have, have uh, the, the whole program has really turned to look for opportunities where uh, we can support the efforts in those countries to alleviate the impact of, uh, of COVID. Uh, so since the pandemic started, we have um, uh, allocated $400,000 over uh, Armenia and Uzbekistan in support of local uh, organizations um, that are looking to uh, enhance access to social, psychological and medical services uh, uh, in support of COVID uh, recovery. Um, so I think that leaves me with uh, covered trade. So uh, just before con concluding with uh, what I've been doing, um, uh, you mentioned the co-location at the outset, uh, Nathan. So I, I wanted just the physical space of the embassy, I think, would be of interest to some. So uh, when I arrived, uh, it was we were on the brink of moving into a new standalone official residence. And I'm delighted to say that I am speaking to you from it uh, now. So I am actually uh, living in it. Uh, we had it almost poised to start uh, convening events here when COVID hit. So that has been disappointing, of course, uh, but we're here and as soon as we can, uh, we hope to see it very much as a, as a center for Canadians to come together with partners uh, to talk about opportunities for cooperation. Um, our working premises, our chancery, is one uh, that has been identified for some years as a workspace that no longer meets our needs. Um, uh, we do have a new chancery, but it is not yet fit up. So we needed an interim solution. Our interim solution was co-location with our British colleagues. Uh, that was supposed to happen in September of this year, but it was based on a bunch of, uh, well, not renovation, that's a, not the right word to use, but uh, the space that we were going to be taking over needed to be needed some fit up uh, to install our systems. Um, and that required a team both from London and from Ottawa. And that hasn't been possible. So the co-location will still happen, but it will happen much later. Uh, 
bigger than um, than we had hoped. Uh, I, and I'm really, I can't give you any, excuse me, more definite than that because those workers still need to get here and they still can't. So um, until the travel restrictions are gone, and even then we have to figure out the whole quarantine business because to have teams come in and then do nothing for two weeks before they start their work, you can appreciate this is a difficult thing to make happen. So, um, so we'll see. I think at this stage, we are, we are hoping that we'll be in by the end of uh, March of next year, but time will tell. Uh, similarly, we hope to be back to work in uh, fitting up a uh, standalone Canada, beautiful new chancery. Uh, the timeline for that was always going to be four or five years. Uh, we don't know how the timeline is going to be impacted. It may not be very much because, you know, at this stage, uh, it, it, there was demolition work to be done and then for the next year, it's design work. So in fact, by the time construction begins, this COVID may not actually uh, affect it very much, but we'll see. Uh, even the design work, there would have been some travel usually, but again, virtual tools have really gotten uh, much more commonly used. And uh, so that may, uh, that may help us. Um, so that's property. So I, I, I will, I said I'd watch the time and I haven't, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll be quick. So I arrived in mid-January, full of plans. Um, Nathan was one of the first people I met for lunch. We had a great lunch. We talked about plans, talked about all the great things we we're gonna do. Um, I was very fortunate in getting an early date to present my credentials uh, here in Moscow. And so got that done on February 5th. Um, was also able, gracias a Fort de Emile, qui son équipe, to do the same thing in Yerevan. A, uh, uh, a quick trip, but a great trip. Um, had a wonderful reception, met lots of people. Again, had lots of great conversations about opportunities for the future. Uh, we're supposed to get to Uzbekistan in April. Of course, that uh, did not happen. Uh, uh, neither did planned trips to, um, where was I gonna go? In fact, I was, I was on a flight to Anadir, supposed to be, uh, the day after the WHO, WHO declared this a pandemic and I canceled my trip. So I was going to go to Anadir, uh, Yakuts, uh, Ladovostok and St. Petersburg in the time uh, that I was on uh, lockdown. Um, all of which is uh, with a view to, uh, as I said, uh, uh, and as our government has said very clearly, uh, certainly with Russia, uh, that recognizing that the uh, there is a lot that we disagree with, uh, with Russia right now, but there are important areas where we need to cooperate. There are important areas of, of shared priority. Uh, uh, the Arctic is a big area of opportunity, uh, and I really hope to make a constructive contribution to building bilateral cooperation uh, with Russia on that front. Uh, I look forward to working very closely with Serba. Um, uh, I, I met with Nathan, uh, of course, separately, but also had, uh, um, he hosted a lunch, so I was able to meet um, um, some members of the Serba board. Uh, so all this to say that uh, the plans are still there, they're just delayed. Uh, and I am really looking forward to supporting the Canadian community in getting through this crisis uh, and, uh, and to working with the Canadian community, including the business community, in, uh, in forging connections to mutual benefit uh, across all three countries of my accreditation. And so I will leave it there, Nathan. Thank you again so much for this opportunity. And I will do my very best to answer the questions that we received in advance and any that you have received while I've been talking. That's, thank you so much, Ambassador Leclerc, for that uh, very detailed explanation of uh, what you've been dealing with uh, and perhaps what the future holds for us. It's, uh, it's great to hear that we're still moving forward with co-location with our British colleagues at the, at the British Embassy, which is a lovely facility, by the way. Uh, we, were, we were housed at the building next door while they were building it, uh, my, my company was. And uh, we're, we're happy, I had heard that those plans were uh, scuttled because of the problems with COVID. I'm glad to hear that that was just a vicious rumor and that we are in fact moving forward, but uh, 
it will require that delegations come into town and with borders closed, that's hard to do. So we understand that. Um, we do have a plethora of questions here. Some of them very general in nature, some of them specific. You know, I'll start by, by just mentioning that our good uh, members and, and uh, strong contributors, Sky Power, have sent three messages uh, from Carrie Adler, from, from Ava, uh, and another one from, from Carrie, I guess, uh, um, thanking Anique and Ambassador LeClaire for your uh, excellent support. I won't read the messages because they're quite long. I'll ask uh, our friends from Sky Power to send them by email, but uh, we, we do, uh, it's, it's clear that Serba members appreciate the great support that they've gotten from the embassy. Um, one particular question I'm going to start with because it's a poignant one and it's a very relevant one. This is from Bill Kucera, um, uh, a Canadian lawyer who's been active in, in Moscow, been living here for at least 10 years, I don't know how long. He says the Anglo-American school is technically a part of the embassies of the UK, US and Canada. During the past 12 months, however, there have been several developments which have, when taken collectively, would lead one to question whether AAS management and guidance uh, or governance structures are performing to a standard which the Canadian uh, uh, community has a right to expect. Is there a communications channel by which specific issues can be raised with the Canadian Embassy? I'm, we, we have heard uh, problems with the school, and is there anybody who can uh, address those issues? So, uh, well, I will say at the outset that, uh, thank you for the question, the American Anglo, Anglo-American school remains very important to us. Uh, we know it's very important to uh, uh, the expat Canadian community. Uh, any of us with kids know that your lives are different by education uh, for your kids when they are of school age. So it is hugely important. Um, the Anglo-American school has been... Um, uh, in a, has faced really key challenges. Uh, oh, is, is Stefan there? Any? He is, actually. I don't know. You know, the same office down the corridor. Do you want to talk? Hello, Stefan. Question about the school. Maybe this is something that's right up your alley. I don't know. Uh, Stefan, it will explain to you how deeply committed and engaged he is in uh, making sure that all goes well with the Anglo. American school. Um, unfortunately, uh, he. We're also saying goodbye to Stefan, but he is my deputy head of mission um, and has been uh, critical to the governance of AES. So he is best placed to answer this question. Stefan. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, uh, the questioner is right that uh, the three embassies play a special role. We founded the school, and we are uh, the three of us, the three embassies members of the executive committee of the board and we have the majority of the votes on the board. Uh, that's it. Um, there's, a, there's a school management that we don't control. We control the board. Um, we've been actively um, uh, renewing the status, the legal status of the school that's proceeding very well. Um, in terms of responding to COVID, the school was one of the first ones to respond to um, the pandemic and uh, to uh, uh, cease uh, in-person learning and then to move to, to uh, distance learning. A plan is being done, is being put together to reopen the school as planned on August 18th. Uh, this will be communicated to parents uh, uh, in coming weeks. Um, it'll be a mix of in-person and uh, distance learning, but as we did in the spring, we will make sure that uh, the safety and health of the uh, school community is the first uh, and, uh, and only uh, a criteria. Uh, as we reopen the school in the spring, in the in the fall rather. Okay, uh, that's great. Let's uh, let's move on. The very top question, the first one that came from our our good friend and academic uh, David Schimmelpenik van der Oy, who was uh, in Moscow to present his book a couple of years back. Madam Ambassador, any idea of when the Russian border will reopen for Canadians? My answer would be sometime later than now. Do you have any insights there, Ambassador? I do not. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, we, like you, um, over the course of the last few months, have been um, uh, faced with these kinds of questions. Um, and, uh, uh, and the Russian government, like all governments, uh, has been um, you know, 
facing uh, a, a policy environment that is just constantly changing. Uh, and so uh, we continue to ask, but I'm afraid we don't have any special insight. That's fine. Um, we have a political question from Mr. Anatoly Semyonov about uh, the advisability of having one leader in power for a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that one because we're going to try to, to avoid political issues. We want to discuss uh, simple brass tax issues that are of interest to the Canadian community here. Um, so um, uh, let's, let's move to the question from CBC. Uh, our our uh, colleagues, um, Corinne Semenov and Chris Brown have asked uh, how how they can get back to Russia. The Canadian staff of CBC were recalled to Canada temporarily uh, and they can't return now because of the closed border. We understand that some European embassies have helped their nationals return to Moscow. In all our cases, we have homes in Moscow and we are Russian residents. Is there any way the embassy can, can support us? And I did tell Ambassador before this call that uh, it may be that Serba can support you because some business associations have helped they're highly qualified specialists to get back. And yes, you will say, we're not highly qualified specialists. That's a different category. You're right, it is. Uh, but uh, there's no reason why we can't make the same request for a journalist. We've made requests for HQS visa holders. Uh, I'm willing to, to try. The worst that can happen is we can get a, a no. But there is a channel whereby business associations have been making requests to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for specific exceptions for individuals. And they've been getting those exceptions granted. So I don't know, Ambassador Leclerc, do you have anything to uh, add to that? Well, I mean, I'll, 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 uh, I'll start. I don't know whether uh, Dan or Rebecca might have any other insight. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, we are also interested in this uh, question because we've got staff back there in Canada now. Uh, we have not so far been, uh, have, have been trying to get them back but we know we're going to work, or at least we hope we're going to be doing it uh, soon and we too will be interested in understanding uh, the procedures and processes that are necessary uh, to make that happen. Uh, we, we are of course um, uh, happy to look into how we can support um, um, other Canadians uh, looking to get back here. I, I've certainly been seeing in media scans that they're there, there do seem to be reports of, of some uh, able to get back. And um, um, so we'll certainly do some follow up on that and see what we can come up with. Uh, so that's what I would say to start with. I don't know whether uh, this is a sort of issue that Rebecca or Dan uh, might be able to add any, uh, any comments on. Rebecca, are you nodding? Yes, well, I agree with uh, absolutely with your response uh, for two reasons. Uh, number one, of course, we're happy to look into this um, for you. So maybe we can, uh, you know, uh, email separately to get a better sense of what exactly the situation is and what we what we can do. I'm not sure. Second, uh, I just have to, I do have to say uh, as a consul that the government of Canada has reiterated their travel advisory saying that they do advise Canadians do not travel internationally uh, for, for non-essential purposes. So um, while we're happy to try and help, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, certainly a consideration that you should uh, think about. Okay, let's uh, move on with the questions. And, and I'll just finish by saying, Chris or, or Corinne, if you'd like to, to uh, ping me directly, we can discuss this uh, uh, and I can be in touch with, with Rebecca. Perhaps a joint approach, both from Serba and the embassy would be effective here, who knows? Um, uh, an anonymous attendee has asked, will there be a full embassy of Canada in Uzbekistan in the near future or will this take a while? Thank you. Any comments? Those are my two options. <laughs> Yes. yes or yes. <laughs> so um, the decisions on whether or not to uh, to establish an embassy are well above my pay grade, I would say. Uh, uh, and in fact, that is a uh, it's a political decision. Uh, so I, I I can't give you an answer on that. Uh, what I can say is that uh, embassies become necessary when uh, the the um, the demands and the relationship 
uh, make it uh, 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 an efficient platform to uh, to advance our interests uh, and, and to address shared priorities. So I think that what we are seeing now in Uzbekistan uh, with the opening and the reform effort uh, and uh, Uzbekistan's kind of natural advantages of uh, population and geography, their ambitions for the future, certainly are good signs for growth in the relationship, the point at which uh, trade, for example, has grown to the point, trade and investment, for example, has grown to the point where um, uh, there is a very strong business case to be made at the political level uh, for an embassy. Uh, it, that, that's, that's really a bit of a crystal ball, and I, and I, I wouldn't comment on that, other than to say that uh, the, uh, the, the, the trend lines are really positive in the relationship. That's great. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, I, I, I do want to give Kerry Adler his due from Sky Power. He did uh, mention that the, the project they're supporting is a $1.3 billion investment, so it's huge, dwarfs anything that Canada has done in Uzbekistan before for 100 megawatts of solar energy to be generated, and it translates into $400 million of tax revenue and 300 uh, over 300 jobs for Canada. So I just wanted to mention those, those numbers because they were in the, the statement that he issued. And they're also, uh, the plan is also in line with Prime Minister Trudeau's efforts on addressing climate change uh, and taking climate action. Um, Absolutely. Let's see. This is a political question. Um, do you have any comments on how Russian politicians reacted to your gay marriage amendment statement? Or uh, the statement perhaps speaks for itself. Well, I, I can't say anything more than has already been the response that was already uh, provided to uh, CBC in terms of, uh, you know, embassies, our embassies all over the world fly the pride flag and stand in solidarity with the LGBTQI um, uh, community. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be what I have okay. to say. That's fine. Um, I'm going to go to some of the uh, earlier questions uh, from, from uh, Robin Baki of MDA Aerospace. That question was, uh, he would like to understand the uh, impact of export uh, to Russia on the, 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 how the current crisis Im has impacted exports uh, to Russia uh, and how can we better do business with Russia in space and aerospace? Is that a question for Anik or, or uh, Heather perhaps? Yeah. I think Anik, or uh, sorry, I think Heather was going to take this, Anik. Yeah, so Heather, over to you. Yes, thanks, uh, and happy Canada Day, everyone. Uh, nice nice to uh, to be here and speak with everyone today. I'm always happy to participate in, in CERVA events and, and would echo what the ambassador said earlier about how you've done a great job in adapting to, uh, to COVID and, and doing a lot of really interesting and useful virtual events, so thank you for that. Uh, I mean, I'm not a, an aerospace expert, but I will say that up front, but uh, certainly, you know, the sector has evolved uh, over the past few decades more from, uh, from its military roots to civil aviation. Um, you know, we see that with the creation of United Aircraft Corporation, which united several different uh, Russian companies, Russian uh, aircraft producing companies. Uh, and are now doing a joint venture with uh, uh, China, Russia, or with the Chinese Aircraft Corporation, the, the famous Crake G, uh, joint venture, the China Russia Aircraft uh, International Project, uh, which in which they're working to develop long range, wide body uh, commercial aircraft. Uh, this, of course, creates a lot of commercial opportunities for Canadian companies, and we see a lot of them are pursuing these opportunities. We're also seeing Canadian companies pursuing opportunities in, in light aviation. Uh, reliable engines, uh, light uh, weight helicopters, and a, a general modernization of the Russian uh, aircraft fleets. Um, so, so there are still opportunities. I mean, I, uh, threats obviously uh, to Canadian companies working in the sector include the import substitutions uh, policy that the, the Russian government put in place, I think actually two years ago today. Um, and so that of course creates uh, barriers for Canadian companies um, well, for Western, for any Western-made aircraft uh, and equipment uh, worth more than a certain dollar amount, I believe it's around uh, $4 million Canadian. 
um, who are trying to sell to, to Russian state-owned enterprises or corporations that have over 50% ownership by the, by the Russian government. Um, buyer financing is another, uh, another challenge that we've seen, and of course, as is end user restrictions as it relates to, to sanctions. Uh, in terms of the, the impact that COVID has had, I mean, I think we're still waiting to see. To see, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit too early for me to, to give a definitive answer on that. Um, I would say generally, though, and this isn't just for the aerospace sector, but for the um, for other sectors, uh, for Canadian companies who want to pursue opportunities, you know, once things have normalized. You know, one of our, our, our main recommendations is to come here to meet people in order to build your networks. That's very essential. Uh, you need to understand the domestic context and the culture in order to do uh, to be successful in business here. Uh, in some cases, depending on the nature of your, your business, local representatives or agents to help with the Russian language, uh, to help kind of navigate the regulatory environment are also very important. Um, and then I would do a little pitch, I guess, for the Trade Commissioner Service and what we do at the Embassy as well, because these are things that we can also help you with. You know, our mandate is to help Canadian companies doing business abroad, and specifically uh, at the Canadian Embassy, we work with companies pursuing opportunities in Russia, Armenia, and Uzbekistan. Um, you know, we offer uh, four different core services. We offer, you know, preparation for international markets that's done largely by our regional offices across Canada. Uh, we provide qualified contacts and market intelligence uh, catered to your company needs, and we also help with problem solving any sort of different market market access issue that you might have. Um, you know, we were fairly reactive in Russia uh, due to our policy related to the sanctions. However, we're quite active in Uzbekistan and uh, and Armenia. So happy to work with Canadian companies. Uh, so please, you know, maybe uh, through Nathan or other server contacts, if there's anything that we can do, please uh, get in touch with us directly to to assist you. That's a, a follow-up question to that from uh, Positron Access from uh, Reg Weiser. There, does current Canadian policy permit? the trade commissioners to assist Canadian companies with introductions in Russia. I know that that's a, an issue. Yeah, so we do have uh, have more reduced services, I guess you could say, in Russia. Uh, we work on a reactive basis. So unfortunately, we can't uh, do the same type of promotion work in Russia that you might have received or experienced from the trade commissioner service in other markets. So unfortunately, things like doing uh, introductions is something that we generally do not uh, do. We can support advocacy work if you're having market access issues. That's absolutely something that we can do. Uh, but we don't organize missions. We don't organize any sort of proactive promotional activities in Russia at this time. If I, if I may add, um, we're reactive, but proactive if, if you ask us to do something. So if you ask for service, if you ask for information, if you ask for connections, we'll provide that to you. So please ask. Thank you, and Thank you for that good hint. Point. Um, there are two more very general questions about trade, and then we'll move on to visas. But the, the, the first one, Aiden asks, as a Canadian permanent resident, soon to be citizen, uh, would you please let us know how you see the future of Canadian business with Russia, Uzbekistan, and Armenia, and what is the best way to get support from the embassy? Gary Nash echoes uh, a similar question. He said, do you feel economic opportunities for Canada in Russia, Armenia, and Uzbekistan have been improving or not? Are those two questions? Well, um, I'll uh, start with some uh, general remarks and my colleagues might want to, uh, to add to them. Um, I think just to sort of pull together, I've, I've already mentioned Uzbekistan uh, and a little bit our Armenia, but uh, the, the, in both cases, our trade is uh, quite modest. In Uzbekistan, um, it is, uh, as I mentioned, the growth stats are pretty good. Um, in uh, Russia, the, uh, the, the trade stats have, uh, uh, since 2014, um, have seen a uh, decline, although uh, when you look at imports and exports, uh, you also see uh, rises as well. The Russian operations in the Russian market need to be undertaken within and in, in, consistent with and, and in, uh, respecting those sanctions. So in other words, 
it doesn't mean no trade. It means trade that is consistent with those sanctions, which are there for a particular purpose. And, uh, and the reason that they were put into place uh, uh, remains. So, um, so, uh, so in terms of uh, growth potential, uh, it is, I think, m most, most clear in Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, Nathan offered the, uh, you know, the, the enormous investment of, of sky power. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we want to see more of that and, and we're here to support that. Um, uh, there are opportunities for growth uh, across all three markets. Uh, all three markets and all three markets, there are, you know, we've identified priority sectors uh, where we see the most opportunity. Uh, and if you are interested in uh, just in an answer to your last question, how do you uh, get support from the embassy? I will just echo what Anik said, you ask. <laughs> so um, I don't think you'll ever hear an ambassador or a trade commissioner say there isn't uh, opportunities for growth. It's our job to look for op those opportunities. And uh, we're here to uh, support you in making the most of those. Um, but I would then uh, turn it over to Anik and to Heather for any additional comments that they would like to make. Well, um, I'm sure that Heather will want to add a few words, but if I may, um, We've been seeing uh, an increase of interest uh, in the three markets over the, the last couple of years. Um, and if that's only one uh, demonstration of that, the statistics have been absolutely fantastic. So we, of course, like a good business, we uh, you know, measure our KPIs and how many services we deliver. And uh, the last fiscal year ending uh, in March was actually the best uh, ever since 2014. Uh, and actually in some cases even better than some years before the, the sanctions were put in place. So I think it shows uh, that despite certain constraints that we have, uh, that there is an increase of uh, interest. Uh, I think it's thanks also to the work that you've been doing in Serba. Uh, in terms of informing the business community on uh, opportunities that still exist, uh, you know, so that we're very clear, we've been extremely, you know, consistent, we obey by uh, the sanctions and the policy in place. Uh, so there's no exceptions, but there's still a lot of potential, a lot of things that we can do uh, while we still, uh, you know, operate in, in that environment. Uh, so the latest statistics have shown, have shown that, um, and we're, we're there to, to support. And of course, in Uzbekistan, um, you know, there's huge potential still unexplored despite, you know, uh, great projects like Sky Powers, uh, but also other companies active, you know, in the mining, in the agricultural, in the education sector. So uh, there is a, a lot of hope. Um, you know, and I'm sure that Heather, Stephanie, and the, the locally engaged staff, the very good team that we have in place will help you, you know, to uh, get uh, the results. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador and Anik, for those, uh, those excellent, oh, sorry, Heather, did you want to add something to that? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, that's, that's okay. I, I don't have much to add. I mean, I think both the Ambassador and Anik said it all, but just, just to reiterate that, that, you know, we, we have a lot of Canadian clients, a lot of Canadian companies uh, in, in Russia, you know, they're, they're interested, there's opportunities, um, we do our best to, to assist in uh, Uzbekistan, um, as, uh, as was already said, uh, there's a lot of growth potential and it's an area where we're doing more and more and we're trying to be very proactive, so, uh, so please don't hesitate to contact us if you need uh, any market information. Great. Um... We have a couple questions relating to visas. I'm going to shift gears now. Uh, the first question is quite simple from Carter Johnson, the American Council for International Education, a Canadian working for the Americans, uh, a trader, I don't know. So we love Carter. He goes to the, the Banya with us regularly. Uh, anyway, he says, uh, I would like to know whether the embassy will be prioritizing student visas for Russians and Uzbeks who want to travel to Canada for studies at the end of the summer. That's his question. And the second question is from Robert Lemons of Heartland Chemicals, who, has, who notes that obtaining a visit, visa to, to visit Russia is a very 
tedious process, costly and time consuming, whereas Canada gives out uh, visas to Russian citizens for multiple years and entries. Um, uh, the only time he writes, I got a three year visa was when I lived and worked there, I got a work permit, but as a Canadian in order to obtain uh, a multiple entry for maximum one year, one must apply for a bu business visa. Is there any reason why Russia does not reciprocate to give Canadians the same consideration that Russian citizens get when applying for Canadian visas? And has there been any attempt to push the Russians for a better reciprocity on that? So I think I'll just hand that right over to Dan, if you don't mind, uh, who's in the best position to give good answers to both of those questions. Can you unmute yourself, Dan? We may, we may have lost Dan. I don't know. It looks like he's frozen. Oh, there we go. Second, he's not now, but he's looking at his. Oh, no, you had it, Dan, but you're back on mute. So there I'm sorry. I'd just like to apologize in advance. I, I keep getting the message that my internet connection is unstable. So um, I hope that, I'm, that you're able to hear me. And um, so I'll start with uh, Carter Johnson's question first. Obviously, Canada recognizes the value of international students, both from the diversity that they bring to campuses, but also the economic benefit that they bring to schools in Canada. So with this in mind, obviously, students are one of our priorities. And as soon as the restrictions have been lifted for them to be able to travel to Canada again, this will be something that we will definitely prioritize. Um, as mentioned earlier, the restric restrictions are still in place until July 31st. Um, another challenge is that many schools in Canada have decided to move some or all of their classes online, uh, which poses additional challenges to international students who may not get the same value for money that they expect if they arrive on Canada and then the courses are all, all held online. I know this from personal experience as my, my children, my son is graduating this year, he wants to go to the University of Victoria and they've said that all this, the uh, courses are online. Yeah, he's not too excited about that, but that's just something that's, that's the reality. We're not sure when that will change, but um, I believe that probably, hopefully, that the spring semester that classes will resume some of their normalcy. Um, with all that in mind, there's another challenge as well, is that, is that students who, who, who can apply and which they can do, they can't do biometrics at the moment because the visa application centers are closed and we can't actually finalize the cases until the restrictions are lifted for them to be able to travel in Canada. Uh, there is one exception for students who had their visas issued prior to March 18th, prior to the um, restrictions going into place. If they, if they already had their visa on March 18th, they can travel to Canada. But that's probably, there's probably a very small minority of, of students in that, in that, um, in that category. Uh, one positive aspect about students is that uh, due to all of the challenges in having regular um, events, we have been having more online events. We've been working with our trade colleagues and having trade fairs and trying to have information sessions for students. We don't want to lose the, uh, the interest of students in Canada. And we have seen that there is still considerable interest in, in traveling to Canada once all of these, um, once the restrictions are lifted. Um, I'll move on to the question from uh, Robert Lemons about uh, reciprocity. Obviously, this is a question that it's asked in other countries as well. Um, Immigration-wise, Canada has a, a global policy of not engaging in reciprocity visa or visa issues when it comes to validity or whether it's a multiple entry or a single entry. Um, so for example, if someone applies for a visitor, visitor visa from Russia, China, Brazil, they can expect the same result. Uh, the standard is that they will receive a 10-year multiple entry visa. Uh, this is based also on the validity of the biometrics, unless the passport itself is of a lesser validity. So for example, I, I believe he mentioned that his, his mother-in-law got a visa for three years based on the validity of, her, of a Russian passport. Um, had her passport been valid for longer, she would have likely gotten a visa for a longer period of time. Um, we have raised this fact in the past with Russia. It is uh, our hope that in the future that they, that they may be more generous in their policy, their visa policy, taking into account the, uh, our policies. Uh, we were also planning on raising this during our visa services consular consultations in April. We were scheduled to have them in Ottawa in April where we were going to raise this issue as well. Unfortunately, due to uh, the coronavirus situation, we've had to postpone that meeting and we're not exactly sure when that will happen. 
or whether perhaps that will happen in virtually in the future, but it is an issue that we are aware of. Uh, it lies in the hands of the Russian government to decide whether or not to issue visas longer than one year. But uh, we have pointed out to them that for their citizens going to Canada, we do have that global policy that allows them to have a visa, visitor visa for a much longer period of time. Um, obviously Canada, one of the, maybe I'll just quickly go into the reasons why we have that policy of, of a longer term multiple entry visa. Um, it's a very simple one. We wanna encourage travel to Canada. We wanna make sure that the, the visitor visa is a good value for people. And also, you know, that's good for our economy and it's also good for person to person relationships. When, when people are able to get longer term multiple entry visas to travel to Canada, they will go there, they will make connections with people, perhaps, you know, business connections as well. Um, and it's, it's good, for, good for Canada and good for them. One thing I just wanted to add too is that if anybody does have any questions about uh, visa issues for their businesses, for people trying to get visas to go to Canada when the situation resumes, normality, normality resumes, we're always happy to, to reach out uh, to help and if, if necessary, you know, to work with our trade colleagues to, to even schedule, you know, a, a meetings where we can discuss you know how we can help we're here to help you to uh to to make sure that we maintain those person-to-person -person connections and that we help canada as well so thank you thank you dan thank you so much dan um okay if we go to the uh there there are a couple political questions uh gary nash has asked if if uh, canada values the the role played by the ussr in, uh, in uh, defeating Nazi Germany in World War II. There was, there was a, a scuffle, as we know, a couple weeks ago because President Trump failed to acknowledge the role of uh, the Soviet Union in defeating Nazi Germany when he was congratulating American, the American victory together with the English, as he said. Um, I, I don't think uh, we need to, I, I don't think Canadian uh, government policy has changed on that. You know, Alison, uh, Ambassador Leclerc, do you want to address that or? Uh, well, uh, just to say that we absolutely uh, recognize uh, the, uh, uh, the sacrifice and contribution of the Soviet Union in uh, the victory over Nazism, and it's one that uh, we expressed uh, this year uh, on May 9th, and then again on, uh, on June 24th. Um, if uh, uh, we... we a particular tribute to the area where we did work together, um, the operations uh, uh, known as the Murmansk Run, um, where Canadian forces worked with uh, Soviet, uh, uh, you know, navies in, in supplying uh, forces in that part of the world. So um, it is certainly part of our uh, uh, understanding and absolutely uh, recognition of the sacrifices of the Soviet people to, uh, to that victory. Great. Um, we have a political question from a student at Carleton University asking if the sanctions have been effective and what is Canada's future uh, policy regarding the sanctions. Uh, again, I, I think we're going to avoid that question because it relates to Canadian government policy uh, and neither the ambassador nor Serba creates policy. We simply uh, reflect it and talk about it. If you're interested in, Can in Canada's official policy on sanctions, I would refer you to the, to the website of international.gc.ca where you can read all details about uh, the, the logic for the sanctions, the reasons that they've been uh, implemented, um, and uh, you know, what needs to be done to, to observe them. I don't think anybody here knows uh, the future of the sanctions. That certainly depends on political winds that are far outside of Moscow. Uh, Ambassador, do you have any comments regarding that? Well, I, I don't know that it, it would, uh, I would have any comments that would, uh, certainly consistent with everything you said, uh, 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 Nathan, it, 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 sanctions are a responsive tool. Uh, so uh, so in, in looking to the future, it, is, it isn't one that you can really project. Um, and as far as the ones that are in place uh, now, I think the government has been very clear that the, um, uh, um, and I, I think I can cite the, the Prime Minister most recently made a public statement about the notion of, uh, you know, Russia and the G7 that, uh, you know, the conditions that uh, led to that decision, the conditions that led to those sanctions haven't changed. Okay, that's fine. 
Um, a couple uh, final questions. Mike McAdoo asks how the COVID-19 crisis has impacted Russia's engagement with, with the rest of the world. Are there examples of bilateral or multilateral engagement uh, that has suffered or perhaps even benefited from the crisis? That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I, it, it, it recalls to my mind, actually, I was listening uh, to a webinar yesterday put on by the, the, the Carnegie Endowment uh, with some uh, uh, commentators, analysts in Russia, uh, who were reflecting their view that, uh, uh, that under COVID, uh, Russia has uh, really become a very inward uh, focused. And I, I, was, I was trying to come decide whether or not I agreed with that. Uh, you know, it, Russia is a country for whom international engagement is hugely important. Um, and, um, um, and the level of international activity by the president and, and by the foreign minister and other ministers in terms of visits out and visits in is uh, really extraordinary. Um, but certainly over the last few months with COVID, just by virtue of the crisis, that has not been possible. Uh, it has also coincided with a time where um, uh, of domestic political um, developments with these constitutional amendments. So, so I, I think that there are uh, multiple factors, uh, but I, I think that in terms of substantive Russian engagement in the world and substantive Russian, uh, uh, the priority that Russia attaches to uh, global power projection, um, I, I, I don't think that that has, um, that COVID has affected that. If it has lessened the visibility of it or the activity level, um, I, my own assessment would be that that is at best uh, temporary. Thank at you, Ambassador. Most. Understood, understood. Uh, a quick question from uh, uh, an Armenian citizen. When can Canadian uh, Armenians expect a new honorary consul? In Yerevan, is that uh, in process? Absolutely, it's in the process. Um, it is in the process, but it is a process that has been delayed by COVID. So it is a process that we will advance and complete just as soon as we can. Um, services are absolutely available uh, to Armenians in our uh, uh, in our uh, through our embassy in Moscow. So I do want to reassure anybody. Um, who was listening and concerned with this question that uh, the delay has not been, a, been really due to external factors and we've done our level best to ensure that service has not been interrupted. It's just from a different delivery point and uh, we will be completing that as soon as possible. Great, okay. Here's a, a miscellaneous question. Is there any news about a possible direct flight from Canada such as Vancouver to Vladivostok in the near future? Or is that unlikely? I don't have, uh, as the business community, I haven't heard any information about that. I think uh, most airlines are actually curtailing routes and trying to cut things down and save money these days. Does anybody else have more information on that? Uh, no, but I would also add that um, uh, my understanding, and I am very far from an expert, so I, my, my trade colleagues are probably wondering what I'm about to say, but, um, my understanding of trade of, of those sorts of conversations about flights and negotiations on flights as uh, they respond to the business community and uh, including the airlines uh, interest on the part of the airlines so you know as you say i don't think anybody certainly the airlines they're looking at being able to keep what they've got or or putting that back into uh into place okay um, and the last question that's been, been submitted, and we've got two minutes left, but uh, it deals with corruption. It's an interesting question. Uh, it was kind of Canada, it says, to donate, as is from an anonymous attendee, to donate $250,000 to Uzbekistan to assist uh, in their health efforts during these difficult times. As a Canadian investor in Uzbekistan, I would like to understand how the embassy can help advance projects that have been stalled by possible corruption issues of the Uzbek government. Um, 
uh, that have uh, delayed Canadian initiatives. Uh, it is worth noting that Canada gave Uzbekistan over 100 million in US dollars through the EBRD last year. I fi our finance minister, Bill Morneau, is on the board of the EBRD, uh, and could he be helpful in this regard. Does anybody have information about how to address corruption issues in Uzbekistan? Well, I would say that uh, the embassy uh, and specifically the trade program, but not exclusively the trade program, certainly has a role to play in supporting Canadian business that would include advocacy where Canadian companies uh, run into um, access issues for whatever reason, um, the embassy can play a role in, uh, in uh, advocating um, um, your questioner seems to be speaking very specifically of corruption. And I mean, I, I would say that the Canadian government is also um, you know, one of our objectives in, a, in building our relations with Uzbekistan is supporting their reform efforts and their reform efforts are include um, uh, you know, stabilizing rule of law uh, and um, you know, investor security uh, and uh, the, that business looks for uh, in, uh, in, in determining whether or not they invest their money. So you know, the EBRD effort has a lot to do with that. Um, um, so I, I guess I would say that without knowing the specific issue, but then would turn to my trade colleagues to, uh, to add anything if they wanted. Any? Heather? Um, well, maybe also Heather will want to add uh, something because she's been very involved uh, in the three uh, countries in terms of uh, responsible business conduct initiatives. Uh, so that overlaps with that question. But um, I, I would say, as the ambassador pointed out, uh, you know, we in Uzbekistan, that's a new government. And although it's been almost two years, it's still new and it's changing rapidly. The rules are changing rapidly. So uh, there were some incidents maybe in the past of, uh, you know, corruption or uh, incidents that could have been perceived as the corruption. I think that the current government is trying, you know, to make efforts to uh, clarify rules uh, to improve transparency. Uh, we've been trying to support them in those efforts. Uh, we've been encouraging them, trying to share best practices, including in terms of uh, investment um, and uh, where there is still misunderstanding sometimes um, on specific deals or rules or policies, uh, we try to do uh, our job as also uh, advocates uh, for business interests. Um, and we've been doing that uh, uh, quite a bit, not only in Uzbekistan, but also in Armenia and in Russia. And uh, Heather has been, you know, one of the, the, the most uh, active on the team uh, for those efforts. So maybe you want to add a couple of those. Uh, thanks, Anik. Um, no, I mean, I, I don't really have uh, anything to add other than just to reaffirm your, your point. I mean, that is a, a priority for us in the Trade Commission service is promoting responsible business conduct abroad, um, promoting, you know, Canada's approach, the approach of Canadian companies is important to us. Uh, and certainly um, it, that dovetails into the, the corruption uh, issue and how Canadian companies should uh, should respond, re be responding to, to those types of situations. Um, and then we're always happy to provide advocacy, advocacy assistance or even just advice. Uh, where possible. Great. Well, it's been a, a good, uh, very productive and informative hour and a half. This is the time that we had set to, to finish off our webinar, 8.30 p.m. Moscow time. It's 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, um, I would uh, just like to close by thanking the ambassador and all of her competent staff, Heather, Rebecca, Anik, and Daniel, for showing us that the embassy has our back.
that the embassy is alive and well and functioning, even though it, uh, it may be doing its, uh, uh, performing its functions uh, online or in a, in, a, in a distance way. How do we say that in English? <laughs> so we appreciate very much the support that we've had uh, really since your arrival, uh, Ambassador Leclerc, and the support from your excellent staff. And I will uh, just close by, by saying once again, a tremendous thank you to both Anique for her excellent leadership over the last four years and, and to her able husband, uh, uh, Stefan, who, uh, uh, as uh, Ambassador Leclerc noted, was the de facto ambassador of the Charge d'Affaires for 18 months, I think much longer than anybody expected, and really did a fine job. We were very pleased to have him at the helm during that uh, critical time in our relationship. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we will sign off. If there are any further questions, I would ask you to direct them in writing to Serba, and we'll see if we can get them answered. Thank you all, and happy Canada Day. Canada Day, thank you very much. Yep. Happy Canada Bye -bye Day, now. thank you. Bye-bye.